uh, group in Munich. Today I will moderate uh, the third EU Tech Talk webinar with the title Quadrupole Mass Spectrometers for Monitoring Critical Processes, a Guidance for Selection and Operation, held by Uwe Meisner, Senior Business Development Manager, Mass Spectrometer Solutions. First, I want to give you a, a legal information. This webinar will be recorded. Questions can be sent in the chat during uh, the presentation or after, uh, after the presentation, we will open the audio channels for uh, direct communication. Uh, during the talk, we will, we will mute everyone to reduce the background noise. So, little uh, some information about MKS Instruments. MKS Instruments, er everyone knows in the past, as a provider of barotrons and mass flow con uh, control controllers. Um, yeah, MKS Instruments had been founded in 1961, and this had been where the company had been started, typically with a vacuum processes and semiconductor. Nowadays, the company is uh, completely transferred. We are. We think we are more. Um, we understand us as a leading provider uh, uh, of um, process control solutions. Now, for a couple of industries besides semiconductors, we uh, we have industrial technologies, life, life and health science, research and defense. We have uh, a lot of very innovative solutions in vacuum processing some laser solutions nowadays, motion, photonics and optics, and laser-based process equipment. I think uh, this should be uh, enough for the introduction of the company. Most of you know, I guess, uh, I expect uh, MKS Instruments. I want to give over now to Uwe for his talk. Please, Uwe. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Bruno, and uh, welcome again, everyone. So, topics of my talk, um, first about some introduction, some fundamental comments about process monitoring, why we need process monitoring, what is the benefit of process monitoring, and then covering some details about fundamentals on mass spectrometers, what is important on selecting an instrument um, and, and configuring an instrument, and then I'm going over to operation of a mass spectrometer and also discussing some aspects about the integration. And then I will show you some application examples. And then I think we have plenty of time to for questions and discussions. So I hope everyone can see my, my presentation well. So let's get started. Um, why do we need process monitoring? And there are a couple of couple of things driving that. First of all, typically you have an you have a problem in your chamber and you want to discover what's going on. You want to detect the problem. You want to run into the process, and this is driven to tran technology transitions due to the effects that the processes or chambers never been characterized correctly or efficient effectively. Uh, you may use new process chemistries. You may have changes in we call it downstream processing means your product is being processed before in other processes and there's something changed there and now it's having an impact to your process or the process equipment doesn't give you the information that you need to analyze your, your process and the efficiency of the, of the process. So this is basically some fundamentals about process monitoring. Um, so, and if you look, if you look to process uh, sensors, you will find a number of different different process sensors. Um, here about quadrupole mass spectrometers, we have also optical emission spectroscopy instruments, uh, which is also analyzing um, gases by an absorption uh, spectrum. Um, you can have FTIR spectroscopy, uh, which is typically used for monitoring uh, exhaust uh, gas, gas conditions or you can have other techniques like, like in self-excited electron plasma resonance spectroscopy. And there's a wide range of different techniques, how you can analyze and process. Today, we will focus on quadruple mass spectrometers. 
Um, something what I like to agree for the talk today, at least. Um, often we talk about RGAs. Uh, mass spectrometers often calls RGA, uh, which stays for residual gas analyzers. This is correct for the use of RGAs in high vacuum chambers because there we want to monitor residual gases in your in your chamber. But in our terms for process monitoring, it's it's bit it's a bit different. It's more monitoring of gas composition in your process, in your vacuum process, or even in your atmospheric process. So therefore, I would say let's use quadrupole mass spectrometers um, for for now. But and at the end of the day, the technology, the technique is the same. Right. So which are which are the, the benefits of quadrupole mass spectrometers? Um, QMS systems are universal gas detectors. Um, they can you can be used for different purposes for performance, characterization, optimization, troubleshooting of processes. Uh, they are operating in a wide concentration range or dynamic range down from PPBs to, to a high percent level. Um, they can detect variations in also critical process parameters like power temperature changes or also gas condition changes. But unfortunately, some of the process um, can also cause challenges and limitations for the use of QMS. And therefore, I think we always suggest some to use some expertise from us or from other um, QMS experts to use the QMS system in, in the right way and in an efficient, in efficient way. So there are certainly also some constraints about mass spectrometers. This is a bit historic, and if you're asking some people which really not up to date with today's mass spec technology and you're asking them about mass spectrometers, they typically will say, well, they are not reliable. They are really complicated to operate and the software is complicated. And then if they are failing, um, it's it takes a long time to get it repaired and everything is completed. So we know there are some constraints. But over the last um, 10, 20 years, a lot of things has been changed. A lot of things has been improved. So now the quadruple mass spectrometers are commonly used and widely used in monitoring different different processes. But we know there are still some some concerns about. OK, so these are some opening points. Uh, let's go now to the um, some fundamentals about um, mass spectrometers and aspects in instrument selection. Um, so first, why do we need a quadruple mass spectrometer? Typically, if you have an, an process and a vacuum process, you have in, in total pressure measurement gauge like a baroton or an ionization manometer that is measuring the, 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 the pressure in your chamber, which is good in some cases, but in some cases you want to know exactly which gas is having an impact to that pressure, which are guessing gases causing that pressure. And that is exactly what the quadruple mass spectrometer is doing. This gives give that gives you the, 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 the exact information about the, the gases which are present in your in your chamber. OK, now about um, some basic principles. That's just for, for those of you which are not that familiar with the um, QMS, it's a, big, a bit of a refresh. So the gas mix is introduced to the system via a sampling system to the ion source, and then there is a filament driven by a current emitting electrons, and these electrons will hit the gas molecules and will cause uh, a charge or better an ionization. And these formed ions can now be filtered in the quadrupole filter by changing the properties of the um, electromagnetic field that we are generating here. And since we can change the properties of that filter very quickly, we can have a good gas resolution and, and separation of the, um, of the ions and then detecting the ions uh, on the detector. And what you get at the end is such a an, an mass spectrum, which is representing the gas mix um, of your chamber or of your of your process. 
And as I said, the advantage is it's it's high sensitive. It's operating in a wide dynamic range. Uh, it can have a high scan speed or resolution in terms of time. And it can operate from ultra high vacuum up to atmosphere. But it needs to have some corresponding inlet system because the whole concept here works only at pressures below 10 to minus 4 millibar. So if you want to use the system at a higher pressure, you need to adapt in pressure reduction or an inlet system. So let's look a little bit more in details on the on the system. Here you see how in quadruple uh, analyzer looks like. Uh, here in, in front you have the ion source, then you have here the quadruple mass filter, and you have here the detectors. Uh, and, and we come to that to that a bit later. Right. Um, let's look a little bit about uh, the, the model of the ionization. Um, typically, when we ionize a gas, in our in our case, we uh, we will have a positive charge of of a molecule or an atom. So typically, in ideal cases, we are losing one electron uh, from the atom. Um, from the outer shape of the electron and we have single charge. If we are losing two electrons, we have a double charge. But we always ionize, um, uh, we charge them the ions positive. And typically what we can also have in the ionization on this um, electron impact ionization that we will cause some fragmentation. And the typically example is here on water where the water will be fragmented in OH part or HO part and in hydrogen part. But all of them are related to the signal uh, from, from water. So this is basically saying um, about ionization. In case that you have a double ionization, you need to be aware that the mass of the molecule, because we are, we are measuring the mass of a molecule, or an atom, the atomic mass units. That's what we measure fundamentally. Um, we can have also a double charge. And, and since we are selecting the ions by the mass to charge ratio, that means a double charged ion will be uh, cause a signal at half of the nominal uh, mass signal. So in this case, argon has a mass of 40 AMU, and if the argon is double ionized, it can have a signal at 20 AMU. If it's double charge. This is something you need to keep in mind when you want to interpret the spectrum, when you want to understand the, de the, te the, the spectrum, keep in mind that you cannot also uh, uh, double ionization or double charge signals. Okay, um, looking to the quadrupole mass filter, it's really the most the most complex element in an uh, in a mass spectrometer. And and it gives actually the instrument a name. And so what we basically create here in the in the middle of the of the mass filter, we, we create an electromagnetic uh, field, and we drive that field by a constant frequency and an overlap uh, DC voltage. And by changing the the amplitude and the DC voltage, we can change the properties of this electromagnetic field. And by a relatively quick change of these properties, we are in a position to select the ions on their mass to charge ratio. And that can be done relatively quickly. And that gives us the benefit that we can have a good uh, time resolution. And then the ions, which will be resonant in uh, the current filter conditions, they will pass the filter and they will reach the detector. So the symbols detector is the Faraday plate. So the ions will hit the plate, they will get discharged, and they will cause a an, an current. It's also called the ion current. And um, um, the ion current will be will be um, um, uh, amplified over an operation uh, amplifier, and basically we get an an analog um, voltage as an output from the electro from the electrometer. And the Faraday is a really nice detector because it's operating very linear. 
However, it has some limitation if you want to detect very low uh, traces and very low concentrations. In this case, uh, you want to use then a multiplier, which is an, um, in this case a microchannel multiplier, which is doing an, an, an amplification of the incoming ions into an uh, into electrons and you see that here in this in this arrangement and our multiplier this is such an arrangement of multiple little tubes which specific surface conditions and there's also a bias voltage applied to the multiplier we have here an amplification of the incoming ions into text uh, into the into elect electrons and we can reach here amplification or we call it also a gain of a factor of 3000. So that's the factor between the incoming ions and the exciting electrons can go up to 3000. And this is a nice amplification effect and that gives us the, the, the chance to detect very low traces. This is really nice, but you need to keep in mind that comparing to the Faraday detector, the electron multiplier is not an ideal linear detector. It works relatively linear in the low concentration range, let's say from 100 parts per billion up to 100 ppm roughly, yes. But if you want to measure higher concentration with the multiplier, you need to understand that there are some in unlinear linearity effects and some errors um, on the on the readings. Right. So how about um, selecting the instrument and selecting the instrument and selecting an instrument for the purpose that that you need. First and the first fundamental question is the operation. Uh, pressure. So you need to know what is the operation pressure, in which pressure you want to analyze the gas, and which pressure you want to uh, use the quadrupole mass spectrometer. In some cases, it could be the case that you ha may have two different pressure regions. So maybe a higher process pressure or a base pressure, or maybe two different uh, process pressures. This is also something what we could cover. Um, then you need to know, uh, or we need to know, uh, which gases are present in the process and which potential byproducts you can have. So which reactions taking place in your chamber, and that's important to know in for selecting of materials, um, pumping, specifying pumping system, and so on. Um, temperatures is also an important fact. We need to know in which. Um, um, on which temperature your process is, is, is running, because we are ideally want to keep the instrument at the same condition, at the same temperature, in order to um, avoid any adsorption, desorption effects. And you need to pay attention to the sampling connection, to the connection where you take the gas from, from, your, from your process. And you see here a nice overview about the, the various systems that MKS is offering. Um, it's here now labeled ALD, but it's 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 covering all of the processes. So it goes from from systems for high vacuum, ultra high vacuum systems, up to systems up to um, atmospheric pressures. And um, you have to we have the whole range um, for different applications for different processes available. Right, so in our topic, we said of the talk, we said critical processes. So what that critical means here and that for that talk. Um, first in process that is maybe having really tight control windows, often called, called a, a low CPK. So there's some some risk that your process is running out of control for, for various reasons. Or it could be a a process that is using chemistry which can cause undesired reactions, cross reactions um, that you wanna that you want to control, that you want to monitor, formation of byproducts. Or you have maybe a process where you have inconsistent conditions of the process substrates. 
So you may want to have some control about what is the incoming quality of your substrate, whether it's in semiconductor wafer or in glass panel or something else. And processes which are requiring the monitoring of really small traces of background gases, because these background gases can have an impact to the to the layer quality, to your product quality, or they can have also some uh, undesired reactions or defects on your on your layer. And um, critical is also um, a process maybe where an endpoint detection is required where we want to measure maybe a byproduct chemistry change. Typically example here is, is an endpoint detection for edge or endpoint detection for chamber clean processes. So that's what we mean in this in this talk with critical. OK, let's talk about ion sources. Ion sources is, is a crucial part of a mass spectrometer. Uh, it essentially defines the sensitivity and the quality of the data. And we basically differentiate between open and closed sourced ion source concept. Uh, open ion sources on the left side are typically used for high vacuum and ultra high vacuum applications where assembling or where we don't need a sampling or pressure reduction system. It's measuring measuring the gas directly in the chamber in your high vacuum chamber. And these open ion sources are limited in applications where um, we don't need an, an, an inlet system. So it's really um, directly in, exposed to the process. The closed concepts are state of the art on systems with higher sampling pressures. So typically use a high vacuum system, uh, maintaining the RGA in its optimal operation range um, at 10 to minus 6, 10 to minus 7 millibar. And the pressure in the source will be slightly higher than, than the, um, the RGA chamber pressure, which gives us a higher sensitivity. And unfortunately, some of the gases tend to create uh, meta stables, which are molecules with some charge, but not fully ionized. And the meta stable lifetime is typically very, very short. If you talk to, to the physics um, and they would say, hey, meta stables, they have just a, a few milliseconds lifetime. But this is long enough that these meta stables can pass the filter and reach the detector and causing some noise in the detector. And therefore, we have implemented a VLANS te technique, which is basically an energy filter which um, lets only fully charged ion passing passing the source and going into the filter and all of the meta stables which are having just some charge will be uh, discharged on a deflector optics on this source and this is um, this is um, reducing the noise level on a detector and improving the limit of detection and with that concept we can we can achieve um, detection limits down to the 10 to 20 parts per billion without um, buying in high uh, performance mass spectrometer which is cost cost a lot of a lot of money so it's a significant improvement um, in terms of detection limits of an on a mass spectrometer the VLANs technique <coughs> And also concerns and the development of MKS is about the robustness of the ion sources. As you can imagine, the ion source is the element that sees all the process gases, and that is completely exposed to the process gases. And this is typically the instrument or the, the part which is failing first if you have a an, an failure on a mass spectrometer. And we have developed and patented a new, uh, we call it robust ion source or an ion source with improved robustness. And all what we do here is we reduce a little bit uh, the pressure in the ion source without many making any compromises on the sensitivity. And we reduce also the critical surface of the ion source. So we have less surface that can be contaminated by your process gas. 
but we will maintain the same sensitivity and, and ideally also we have a better efficiency of ionization on, on that concept. And we have a couple of trials here where we're comparing, comparing the robust ion source with the standard ion source. And what we have seen here is a significant longer lifetime and and also a better a better resolution of um, of the of the spaces. And I think in the next in the next couple of weeks we will present more application relevant data about this new ion source uh, concept. Right. Um, going further to the system is uh, now the gas sampling inlet. It's it's an essential part. Again, um, how to sample the process gas um, in order to have a good um, a sampling speed and, uh, and, and a good um, um, speed of, of sampling the gas and good um, efficient, efficient um, time resolution. So important is um, to minimize adsorption desorption effects and maximize sampling speed. This is the, the two key elements. We also need to achieve some contamination resistance. There could be a lot of things be done by running the system at elevated temperatures and having the inlet pass um, um, done in a, in a good um, surface quality. So all gas vetted um, um, pass or pass needs to be in a, in a certain surface quality and also the material is important. And, and here you see an example where we have some inlet valves which are operated with, a, with a insufficient heating. So you have some adsorption here, you have some uh, deposition of process chemistry of byproducts here, whereas a heated uh, inlet valve will remain clean and will stay clean. And here in this case, on the right hand side, you will see such an example of a dual range inlet. Um, for our mass spectrometer, so you can have basically two, two pressure range, two sampling paths here, one sampling pass over this valve number one, and another sampling pass at higher pressures over valve number two. And we have the whole flexibility to define different, uh, different pressure regions, different operation pressures for your mass spectrometers. Another option we have also here is, is in, this, in this circle, it is about um, uh, sampling or sniffing lines. So in some cases, the mass spectrometers can not be installed very close to the position where your process takes place. In this case, we can add here a sniffing capillary, which can go directly to the place where your action, where your process deposition or your etching takes place in order to improve the the sampling speed and and the time resolution of the system. Right, and another development that we are doing right now is having inlet systems at elevated elevated temperatures. Today we are covering um, temperature ranges up to 120 degrees, and we have seen a number of processes where this is not efficient. There are new chemistries coming, especially from ALD, atomic, atomic layer deposition processes or atomic uh, etching process, um, where higher temperatures are required. And therefore we have developed a new system. It's basically the same concept like the dual pass system. You also see here the dual pass um, um, sampling ways, but we are using here new, a new type of valves which can run up to uh, 200 degrees and uh, very robust. And another benefit is that we talked about pressure reduction and pressure reduction typically require the use of little small orifices to reduce the pressure from your high post pressure side down to the um, um, low pressure side of the mass spectrometer. And in this case, we use, it's called sea seal orifices. They are sitting really directly underneath this valve seat. And then really nice benefit for the customer is that the customer can change these orifices very easily. So in case that you have created some particles or some particles blocking the inlet system, you can easily remove the valves, 
take the C seal orifices off, put a new one in, put the valve on again, and you can operate the system um, very quickly again. So it's also really nice in terms of serviceability of the system. And we pay also attention, especially on that, that the customer can do the service on the system on their own. Right, and then often the question is, what about what about the mass range? And typically there is some expectations from the customer say, hey, I have that chemistry and my chemistry, my molecules having this mass, and I want to measure that mass by the mass spectrometer. And often, if if you look to to chemistries from atomic layer deposition processes. You can have molecular masses up to let's say 400, 500 AMUs. But you need to keep in mind that during the process, you have maybe in plasma or you have elevated temperatures, and during the electron I impact ionization, the most of the molecules will be fragmented. And this is often the case, especially on ALD and precursor chemistry, that you have really characteristic fragments. Um, Typically in ALD, often it's all methyl fragments that, that you see. And typically you may have to see or you may need to monitor for the fragmentation patterns of your chemistries. Because here, if you compare this, this chemistry, which is um, titanium tetrachloride, uh, which is having a molecular mass at let's say 190, which is about about here. You see only a small portion is remaining as an original signal, but you have much more significant fragmentations here. And that's what you may need to consider to monitor, not the, um, the, 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 core, the core molecule, the main molecule, you may need to monitor the fragmentation pattern. Okay. Um, right, and we pay also attention. I mentioned that before. We pay also attention about the serviceability and the maintenance of the system. Um, we want to make sure that the customer can change the significant components on the mass spectrometer on its own. It's well documented in the manuals. We have training presentations about that. So customers can change filaments or can change ion sources. There's no need to return the instruments to the factory, and that's a really robust and solid process. Uh, basically, nothing nothing that can go wrong on this on this process, and that helps also a lot on the acceptance of the mass spectrometers. Okay, uh, now. We're coming to the point um, how to operate the system and, and how we can enhance the value of a quadrupole mass spectrometer by uh, the integration. Um, typically, if you analyze and process and you're just looking to the quadrupole mass spectrometer data, uh, the value is, is a bit limited because often you need to evaluate other, other signals. Uh, also states of the tools, also conditions of the tool, and and correlate correlate that with with the mass spec data. So you may need to find some some algorithms, some rules in in evaluating um, additional additional data, um, like temperatures, uh, gas flows, valve states, you may need to also to correlate information with different equipment recipes that you're running, these type of things that is really enhancing the value of the mass spectrometer. Uh, you also may need to implement some levels of data framing. Um, data framing is really important if you want to do some statistical evaluation of your process stability or your process performance. So data framing require really consistent start and stop condition for your for your frame. And I have later on a nice example about what data framing means. And also different states of the equipment needs to be needs to be um, evaluated um, to to improve the. Um, efficiency of the mass spectrometer. The good thing is all of this stuff can be done in today's available software solutions and there are quite few options how to make that that happening. And if you talk about uh, integration concepts, 
uh, we often have situations to integrate a system in different environments. So um, there could be typically a question about how to integrate a mass spectrometer in on an equipment level or on a factory or fabrication um, fab, fab level. So on equipment level, we typically use protocols like EtherCAT, DeviceNet, Profinet, OPC, Modbus, or custom custom protocols. And there's a wide range of flexibility how we can operate a mass spectrometer here and um, along with the other components that we have over a PLC system. So there's a whole range of flexibility what we can do. And there are also we certainly have some need to transfer the data to factory levels, to factory systems, data collection systems, or even more advanced uh, FTC or APC systems um, in, in various manufacturing sites. So we have the flexibility to have interfaces to both sites, to the equipment side as well as to the manufacturing or the FAB side. And one software that we're using in MKS, it's 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 called Process I Professional. Um, and basically, Process I Professional defines how you want to drive in mass spectrometer, what you want to do with the mass spectrometer. It's defining the measurements, it's it's defining accuracies, detectors, calibrations, and so on. It's defining how to expose the data. But in the background of Process I, um, it is it is an op programming platform. It's it's a platform where you can develop your own specific application. And there is an and visual basic scripting model behind process I, and this gives us the opportunity to develop really specific and highly customized application. And this is a strong, um, strong benefit in MKS that we can provide and develop user specific applications for the customers. This is a big um, difference to, to other suppliers that we are developing together with the customer application specific or equipment or process specific solutions. And we have a whole bunch of uh, libraries of applications um, available and um, there's a lot of ex experience and expertise in, in the group that, that you can utilize. So here are some, some examples about uh, integration. So first and the most simple thing what you can do, you can have such a kind of user interfaces that you can see instead of in process I must spec software, you can just see such an user interface where only the very important functionality of the system is, is shown and visualized and you not just need to pay attention to that and all of the data collection, all of the data um, processing is done in, in the background. And here underneath you see an example about how we can integrate a system in a factory environment in, in talking to the equipment and talking to factory equip, um, factory systems. And we can use a lot of the industrial standard protocols uh, which are uh, available and we can so support these, these protocols. So now, finally, I want to show you some successful applications. Um, the first application, and that's now really a critical, a critical application. Um, it's about an edge process here in this case, gallium nitride edge. And an edge process, we often have the situation that we have to deal with um, reactive, highly reactive, highly corrosive gases, chlorine or fluorine containing gases. And so it is really important to have really a robust inlet system here, a robust ion source system uh, here. And on this example, we have demonstrated a really superior stability over a long time. It required to operate a system at elevated temperatures. But if you have done that and operate a system, you can achieve a really good, a really good stability. And it gives you also now the confidence that such a system can be used as an endpoint detector for your edge process. <clears throat> Another example, and this is this is now this is now a classic a classic example for a process troubleshooting. You see here on this process, it's a titanium nitride atomic layer deposition process and thermal process. 
And you see here at the begin some variations and even if you're not an expert in this process, you see there are some instabilities here and we had some issues with gas flows, white gas flows and 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 temperature changes on your material delivery system. And finally here we got obviously maybe some 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 good stability on the process and it looks like that this process is stable. However, we have in this process some deviations. The question is, how can you observe that? How you can see that? And this, that comes now to a point where I want to show you a little bit about what we mean with data framing. So what we can do with all of these pauses, it's really specific to ALD, but you can translate that to other um, cycling processes. You need to do framing. And on framing, you need to find really start and end conditions. And in this case, we use um, um, pressure thresholds for the chiral gas of the uh, ALD chemistry. So we have here a threshold of an of an pressure for the start condition and a threshold for the end condition. And over this period of time, we do some statistic and some uh, some some framing and some statistics. And so what you see here, if you use a statistical program, which is also um, developed by MKS, you see here all the pulses and all the stabilities, and you can set an, an range here and deviation range that you can accept. In this case, it's very low, 0.5 sigma, it's a very low um, standard deviation range, but I just did this for, for demonstration purpose. And we have seen here that we have some outliers at this, at this point. And if we go one step further and we look really to the wall signals of these outliers, we see here at, that at these four, actually this second second pulse here and this in this section of four pulses, we had a different a different gas composition. So there was something on your pulsing system not uh, working correctly. And it gives you really the benefit that you can achieve by uh, data framing and analyzing framed framed data. What right. another example is um, um, a diamond like carbon deposition, typically a process which is known as a dirty process. Um, so we paid here attention to also an sufficient inlet system and here there was also a need to monitor very low traces of oxygen and water because these are critical for the formation of the nitride process. And in addition to that, the system has been also integrated into the factory environment, uh, in, uh, into equipment and also in the factory environment. And this really shows the benefit that an integrated system is enhancing the value um, of the operation of an, of an QMS. And finally, here is an example um, from um, a pharmaceutical manufacturing. It's actually uh, very, uh, very hot these days. And in some areas, in some industries, we have specific requirements. In pharmaceutical, there is a requirement. It's called GMP, Good Manufacturing Practice Environment, or also related to some regulations. In this case, the FDA regulations where specific aspects of integration and system validations are required. And often there are specific control systems available for that. And the mass spectrometer needs to integrate it directly into that control system without using um, a software, a mass spec software. In this case, we have used the MKS FTX communication library to build in all the functionality of the mass spectrometer into this specific control system. And that gives you at the end a fully GMP conform uh, a system and um, where we really can all bring all the complexity of the mass spectrometer and, and bring it to, to a simplified level and bring it to a level that the system can be, can be operated in these critical um, uh, environments. Yes, so that's that's the end of my talk. Um, yes, we have a couple of minutes left for question and answers and yeah, feel free to to raise your hand or feel free to um, 
use the chat room for asking questions. Maybe uh, here we have two questions in the chat from Carlos. Hi, thanks for this nice presentation. What about potential artifacts due to gas segregation when using small size orifices in case we want to measure at atmospheric pressure? Yes, good, good question, correct question. Um, the approach is often it's being used, considered to use single orifices. I go back maybe to few slides in my presentation. Um, where oh. yes, that one. Look to this blue pass. Um, let's see. Consider this is atmospheric pressure. Uh, can be atmospheric pressure. And and what in theory you could do, it would be sufficient to put just one orifice here at this position to reduce the atmospheric pressure down to the 10 to minus 6. And that would be a very, very small orifice. And I do agree there's a high risk for uh, blocking the orifice if something goes wrong and you're creating some particles or some particles will be going into the inlet stream. In our case, we decided, hey, let us split that high pressure range into a bypass pass where maybe about 99% of the gases goes directly into the pumping system. And by that, we can make that orifice significantly bigger because we have here one stage of pressure reduction and here we have another stage of the pressure reduction. And by configuring this, this arrangement in, 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 in a suitable way, and and we can we can make an orifice bigger without causing any eliminating the risk for for blocking that on on particles. And on top of that, I mean, if we really have the case that something gets blocked, you may have to choose that inlet system where you can easily change the orifices. And the, the orifice here in this concept is a really a cheap part. It's less than uh, one hundred dollars part, less than fifty dollars part. Relatively easy easy to change. But it's right, blocking orifices can be can be in risk depending on the chemistries and de de depending also on your cross reaction on your on your process. Okay, then there is a next question. Also from Carlos, is there any development on the integration by using Python? Python. Yep. Um, honestly, I'm not sure about I'm not sure about that. Um, it is not yet on the radar. We need to look into the details on on this Python, and and and. Okay. Then we have uh, another question. This time from Tao B Li Lo. Hi, Uwe, thanks for sharing. Have communicated with you about bulk gas application to detect about zero about to one PPB impurities. Just uh, wanted to follow up with you if you have new technology to do this application. Yes, Tauri, welcome again. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, for that, I would refer to another talk about um, gas analysis, atmospheric gas analysis, which you can also find on our on our network where I have um, covered some specific aspects on, on biogas monitoring and trace detection for biogases. Uh, so maybe we can have some side communication ab about that. And um, you can also refer to the, to the NASA talk that I have done before. I think it was last month. It was labeled atmospheric gas analysis by quadruple mass spectrum radars. But let's let's talk. Let's talk offline about this. We are in contact together. I know. Um, let's let's keep in touch about atmospheric gas analysis. Maybe you also allow one question from my side. Here you from this slide before you talked about uh, now you have temperature capabilities about which temperature? Yes, currently we are having um, 200 degrees. 200. Uh, wow. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. In the past. We, we we had limitations down to 90 or 120 degrees. Now we achieve 200 degrees. Mm -hmm. And I guess your question is now, what is the maximum temperatures? And yes, there are some, 
chemistries, we know that some chemistry requires even higher temperatures. Um, there are some really um, challenging ALD applications or atomic layer etching applications on the radar, on the horizon, which are requiring temperature up to 300 degrees. And we have also there um, selected an in, in Valve, and it's actually uh, the same the same supplier. It's a Japanese company, which are um, offering also valves up to 300 degrees. Mm -hmm. um, 300 degree, of course, would require a different way of heating of the whole inset in it. But um, very soon we will have also solutions for up to 300 degree available. Yep. Okay, uh, Carlos is asking again. Not sure if I can put him on the openness. Uh, um, okay, I will read it. In relation to the gas segregation, I was referring to a different pumping efficiency when having a differential pumping system with small orifices to be able to operate under atmospheric pressure. Um, yeah, I mean, the selection of the pumping, it's, it's a question, if I understand the question correctly, is um, is there a specific pump configuration when you want to operate at atmospheric pressure? Generally speaking, I would say no, but uh, depending on the gas characteristic, we may have to choose specific pumps. So if you're sampling or you want to analyze corrosive or reactive gases, we need to choose pumps which are corrosively prepared. So there are specific pumps with specific membranes or specific bearings, uh, in case of turbo pumps and so on. So there are corrosive prepared pumps. In some cases, we also need to look when you want to monitor or analyze high concentrations of, of hydrogen. In this case, we also may need to pay some attention on on pump selections. Yeah, but it's it's right. Depending on the gas you want to analyze, you need to pay a bit of attention to to the configuration of the pumps. But um, good news is we have we have the experience. We have all the choices in our instrument selections. Uh, we can we can deal with that. Thanks. Some additional questions from the audience. When you uh, when after this talk, maybe you have additional questions, please feel free to contact us. No problem, we try to answer as fast as possible. Yeah, thank you, Uwe, for the really nice talk. Yes, yeah, thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks for joining the talk today. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me by email, contact our MKS office. Um, and we are happy to work with you. One moment, I'm checking. Ah, Carlos. You're open now. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, Carlos, uh, we know each other. It's stay in, we stay in, we stay in contact. We keep the contact. <laughs> OK. OK, then thanks, everyone. Have a good remaining day and stay safe. Thanks a lot sure. once more again. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay, bye. Bye.